All right, let's start in Matthew 12. 33 is where we'll start. I've been catching my words and noticing that I'm saying things with my mouth that aren't true. So, for instance, uh, if I were to say, if I were to be talking to uh, Trudy, and I were to say something that in, in, along the line of John King and I aren't really good friends, well, Trudy might hear that and go, that doesn't sound right to me. Because I think you and John are, are good friends. But I might have some feelings deep down in me or some beliefs deep down in me that maybe sometime in the past John has felt differently about me that I'm not able to get over. And so my mouth will basically expose what's really in my heart. Does that make sense? Okay. This passage right here, um, it would start to read in verse 33 of Matthew 12. It says, if you make a good tree, and it, uh, if you make a tree good, uh, its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. Well, how do you make a tree good, or you make a tree bad? Obviously, you're going to have to do something to one of those trees. You, you might can plant the tree that's good around a source of water. You might can, uh, if, you plant, if you're going to be bad to a tree, you might plant it in the middle of a very dry place. Or you might even abuse that tree in some way. You may run over it with the lawnmower when it's just a little tree. You ever done that? Forgot you planted a tree there and ran right over that thing. So, I mean, that's one way to treat it bad. And I guarantee you, its fruit will be bad. So, he says the fruit will be bad for a tree is recognized by its fruit. If there's healthy fruit on there, you assume the tree is good and healthy. If it's not, you assume the tree is not healthy. He's speaking here to religious people. Now, remember, when Jesus says harsh words like this, it's not that... We need to ask ourselves the question, is he talking to that person as a person or not? Because there's not one human on the planet that Jesus did not die for including the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, including the ones he, who, who he said, you go out and make a convert and you make them twice a son of hell as you are. That's pretty stout language, isn't it? So it makes, you under, it makes you wonder if this is someone, for God so loved that Pharisee that he gave his only son, his motivation for sending Jesus was not to condemn that Pharisee, but to Save him. For the Son of Man came not to condemn the world, but to save it. The motivation of God is love. And it's the redemption of this Pharisee, this teacher of the law, this Sadducee, this whatever it is. Or this, or Zacchaeus, who, or this Samaritan woman, or anyone else that the insiders considered outsiders. He didn't just come for the outsiders. He came also for those who thought they were insiders and had made the rest of the world feel like outsiders. No one is somehow eliminated or left out of or has found themselves too far away from the love of God. No, no one. Mm. I'm usually okay with that until no one is someone who has caused severe damage to my life or to my family. And then that no one is, if they're not outside of the reach of God's love, they're real close. There's some people that I just assume God not be as loving to. Now he says, uh, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good for out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him so out of the out of the mouth comes the overflow of what's in my heart okay so if in my heart I somehow believe that there is some kind of distance between John and I, although we never talk about it, let's just say, and it slips out to Trudy, Trudy might hear it and go, what is going on between Tony and John? Because out of the mouth, what was in my heart was exposed. Exposed. 
You ever catch yourself saying, I just want to be closer to God. Well, if what Jesus prayed, if His... You ever wondered if the prayers that Jesus prayed were answered? (laughs) Can you imagine Jesus, the Son of God, having an unanswered prayer from His Father? And so when He says, in that day, I pray that they will know that Jesus is saying this, and He's saying it about David, and He says that I am in David, and David is in me, and David and I together are in the Father. Well, I want to ask you something. How much closer can you get than that? The issue there for us is not that we're not close to God. The issue is is that we're not aware of our closeness. It's like the prayer that Paul prayed in Ephesians 1 when he said, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you would know. He didn't pray for something new to come true for them. He prayed that they would become aware. The eyes of their heart would be opened, enlightened, that they would become aware of what already is true. You ever find yourself thinking thoughts about yourself that aren't true? Like that there is something in your life that has not been covered by the blood of Jesus? You say, well, I don't know. I I don't think about it that deep. Well, let me ask you this. There's there's fruit that comes from that kind of thinking. Guilt. Guilt. Shame, worry, or a fear that God is holding something against you. You ever catch yourself saying, well, I hope the Lord will overlook that. If I said to you right now, there is not one sin ever known to humanity that God has ever overlooked, that feels a little scary, doesn't it? But you see, that's actually good news. Because the truth is, if He had overlooked something, it would not have been touched by the blood of Jesus. The truth of the matter is, He has not overlooked anything. He has forgiven everything. There are three words that I use a lot with myself and and when I teach, and I know you've heard them before, but they're these three words, dirt, distance, and delay. Dirt, distance, and delay. They're probably the three things, if you look through Scripture over and over again, they're probably the three things that the accuser of the brethren uses the most to create some kind of doubt in us some kind of place where we're not resting in the finished work of the cross in our lives. He makes us think that there's some dirt in our life that Jesus has not taken care of. He makes us think that there is distance between us and God. And He makes us think that there is delay between His blessings and our life. There's a delay there. How can there be dirt if there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? How can there be dirt if you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? How can there be unworthiness? There's some things I just can't sing. It has nothing to do with what, with Diane leading or anything like that. It's just there's some things I just can't sing because as I'm singing them, I realize I'm singing something that's not true. We don't sing many of that, much of that at all. But there are thoughts. They, they get ingrained in our mind like a, a, like a wagon wheel running down a road. And if it runs down that road over and over again, day after day after day, it'll begin to cut a rut. 
it'll begin to cut a rut on that path. And before we know it, we subconsciously think that and believe it, whether we know we are or not. There are pictures of me when I was an infant. Uh, I was only about this tall then. When I was an infant in my baby bed with a, ba a full-size basketball. Not some little old Nerf ball that you'd get a young child. No, a real basketball bigger than I was in my baby bed. By the time I could form thought, I didn't have to think about there being a basketball in there. It was just a part of my subconscious existence. You just move that ball over so you can eat. I never thought anything other than I just have kind of grown up with it my whole life. Let me tell you something else I grew up with my whole life that I don't have to think about. I grew up watching a mother get up. She was always up before I got up. And when I came in there, that Bible was open on that, on that dinner table. And her little prayer list was right there. And my name and my brother's name were at the top. And her husband, my daddy. I've told you before, many nights I'd wake up in the middle of the night and she'd be asleep down there on the bottom of our bed. There wasn't much space. I was 6'8 and my brother was 6'5. We slept in a full-size bed, the two of us, until I went to college. There was more off the bed than on it. Legs hanging off everywhere. My mother would find a spot down there and she'd fall asleep reading her little Bible over us. I have never had to wonder or have a thought about my mother's love. Now, that, what she did does not prove her love um, for us. It's just the way she expressed it. It's how she grew up. It's what she knew. I get a, a kick out of the creativity of Laura's uh, Facebook photographs with her kids. Uh, Robinson there, in case anybody's wondering. The one right back there. So, With her kids. Because they're all so theatrical, I guess. They, you know, I, I've never seen a, a photo where one of them wasn't like this or something, you know. I mean, it's the craziest, funniest stuff you've ever seen. I mean, they, they, they have an expression of how they share love with one another. Her kids don't ever have to wonder that. As difficult it is, as it is for Miss Ann right now, Dee never has to wonder if his mother is praying for him. And if she loves him. Now, I want to tell you something. Kids don't always respond uh, to that because other factors come in through the years. My brother always had the most difficult time believing he was loved. Why? We don't know. Was he treated any differently from me? You dadgum right he was. He was her baby, and I'm still a little bitter about it. He, he just was like, they, we all ran around to see what Lynn needed, see what Lynn wanted. I need some counseling, Nathan. I appreciate it if you'd call me this week and we could. There's some things that are just, they're just, they become a part of who we are. That's the way the love of God needs to be in our lives. To where we don't have to hear someone tell us over and over and over again from the outside a human. Because God Himself who's living inside of each one of us. We can hear Him telling us. We can feel His aroma, His presence inside of us. We can feel the work of the great high priest Jesus inside of us. We can sense the presence of the Holy Spirit inside of us. And the primary work of the Holy Spirit is to take from what belongs to Jesus and make it known to us. And what belongs to Jesus is us. It's us. To where we become more aware of what is being said from inside of us than we are of what's being said from outside of us. Okay, so I could put my three, I'm not going to put my three chairs up here, but I hadn't done this in a while, but I could put the three chairs up here. And uh, I was reading in where Jesus was talking about... Um, it starts off that passage, and I, I can't, John 13, I think. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Okay, now just think about that. How many of you are on Facebook? 
How many of you have noticed troubled hearts in the last 10 days on Facebook? I mean, it's like wars have broken out. So I'm not getting into all that. Because <laughs> no wars are breaking, are, 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 we don't have any wars here. Sometimes in my life, I struggle with being more connected with what is happening around me than I am connected with what is happening inside of me. The, <laughs> thank you very much. The very Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we are debating over externally out here actually lives inside of us. We don't have to drive to Washington or downtown Nashville or some capital or the courthouse down here to experience God life. More, more powerful than God living in the existence of nations or groups of people or whatever is that God is living inside of us. So, Here's the three chairs and the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And here I am seated right here in the chair with, with Christ. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. That is, this is my home now. This is who I am, where I'm from, how I live, what I live from, where I live from. My connect is in this family right here. Not only am I in this seat, come here Edward. Come on up here. There's a black guy in this seat with me. He's younger than me and he is black. Black, 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 black. We are together in Christ. Yes, we are. You see that? This is our connect here. Not what we're experiencing out here among people on the planet. Oh, you're black? I didn't notice that when we were up here. When we were in, I just saw, saw that you were in Christ. But when we get down here in the world, all of a sudden, you're black? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. This is the place we live from. We're no longer of, this is going to be, you're going to get a workout here. We're no longer of this world. We have been, what, Brother John? Born again. And we live from here. There is no black and white. There is no male nor female. There is no Russian or American or Middle Eastern. There is no Jew nor Greek. There is no us nor them. This is where we live from. Here, I don't, I don't discuss confederate flags. Here, there's no discussion of that crap up here in the heavenly places. That's C-R-A-P if you're taking notes. <laughs> there is no discussion of stuff that doesn't matter to God when you are in Christ. And God forbid that we begin to live like we are of this place and not of this place. I did not intend to say all this today. <laughs> Let me tell you what is truer. Let me tell you what is truer than I'm white. I want to tell you what's truer than that. I'm white and you're black. What's truer than that is <laughs> we are in Christ. We are in Christ. Let me tell you what's truer than he's old and I'm young. I said it like I wanted to, Kevin. Let me tell you what's, what's truer than I'm old and he's young. Okay? What's truer than that is 
There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We've been called to a higher standard than being a Republican or a Christian or a Democrat or a whatever kind of better Christian than the regular Christians. We've been called to something way higher than the stuff we've created in this world. We have been called to this seat right here. And this is where we live from. It's the aroma of Christ that makes a difference. Not who wins the next election. It doesn't matter who we put in office. The aroma of Christ is what people need a whiff of. So what happens is, here's what the aroma of Christ looks like. What we smell like when we're here in Christ, we decide to stay in Christ as we walk around in this world. And the aroma that's from up there is the aroma that is down here. Thank you, Edward. I appreciate you going along with that today. Let's look right quick at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. It's powerful. It's powerful. There's a better place to live from than Facebook. <laughs> or non-social media Facebook. You know, back porch talking. You know, the coffee shop talking. You remember, this has nothing to do with anything this morning. I just had this thought and it was funny, so I thought I'd share it. Do you remember... How many of you remember all our phones having a cord? You only had a cord on your phone. There was no phone without a cord. Maybe the president had one, but we didn't know about it. Okay, and it was what? Yeah, and get in knots, wouldn't it? How far down the hall have you tried to stretch that cord to get away from your mom and daddy hearing who you were talking to on the phone before? And you'd face the other direction. Maybe they were down there in the house, you know. I just thought I'd share that. You don't have to write that down. Uh, chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians and verse 14. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession. Do you hear that? There is never a time when you're not being led in triumphal procession by God Himself. There is no distance between you and your Father. There is no delay in His blessings in your life. You have been, past tense, given all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. I don't feel that way. That don't change the truth. Does it, Steve? It don't make it not true. If Ryan says to me, I say, Ryan, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm fireman. Well, I don't believe that. Well, does that mean he's no longer a fireman? He's a plumber now. I think you look more like a plumber. Okay, Ryan is a plumber. Did y'all get that on the video? You had the shot right here, okay? Brian pulled, he pulled his britches up there so when I called him a plumber. Just because I decide he's, he reminds me of a plumber doesn't make him not a fireman. Just because your emotions or somebody else's sermon you heard when you were 14 years old or the voice of a relative that told you over and over again that you had no value, it does not change the truth that God knows about you. Believe the truth. There is no distance between you and God. He emptied heaven. The whole crew. It wasn't just Jesus. It wasn't just the Word became manifest or flesh in Jesus of Nazareth. 
God was in Christ when He was reconciling you to Himself. All of heaven emptied into you, Amory. Boom! Nothing left. There's nothing outside of, of Amory. All of the kingdom of heaven is living inside of her. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Phil Sturgis coming in the back right here. I just wanted to let you know. I, this guy showed up on my Facebook, Phil Sturgis, and I was like, I don't remember anybody named Phil Sturgis. And I thought, well, okay. And then I saw the next time that I said, here's a picture of Bill there. I said, well, he knows Bill. So he must be okay. So I went about a month like that thinking Phil Sturgis was friend of Bill Burgess. Till it hit me one day, Sturgis, Burgess, it is Bill. I feel better about it now. But I'm calling him Phil. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. And through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. Now, the fragrance of the knowledge of Him is an interesting term. Because where it says the knowledge of Him, it makes it sound like it's what I know to be true about Him. So I'm telling other people what I know about God. That's not, that's not the context of that passage. Nor is it the way the wording is in the Greek. It is His knowledge. It is what God knows to be true. He says... We always lead us in triumphal possession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of what God knows to be true. Do you want what God knows to be true or what you think God knows is true? How many times have you ever had a relationship break up or distance itself because you thought the other person believed something about you Come to find out, they never thought that at all. And you avoided them when you'd see them. And then you found out that, that you were just assuming they thought that about you. You don't want what you think about God. You want what God knows about Himself. You say, well, I don't, I don't know all of that. Yes, that's right. We believe it. We trust it by faith. Like, I, I'll give you a simple little example. We say things like, well, God is good. And what's the church say? Really? I mean, I know it sounds good. It looks good on the beginning of the video when you put it on the YouTube. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Really? Do I really believe that? I do on Sunday morning. Sometimes. And I've learned to smile big on the other times on Sunday morning. You know, what is it that God knows to be true about Himself? I don't know all the answers to that. But I know He knows, and my faith is not in my ability to know. My faith is in that He knows. My faith is not in that I am able to keep that which I've committed. My faith is in that he is able to keep that which I've committed. We sing songs and we have poems about it. I don't even know that one song about... Uh, well, forget it. I can't even think of the tune. It goes like the wheels on the bus go round and round. We could sing it if I could think of the words. And then he says, In Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. For we are... To God, the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To one we are the smell of death and to the other the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. We are the aroma of Christ. Did you know that you're the aroma of Christ? The question is, do I always smell that way? No. I don't. When I feel disconnected from the truth of the reality of who I am, come here, Edward. When Edward and I live our life more aware 
of where we're living from, we can be the aroma of Christ to one another. As a matter of fact, Paul would say that we're actually one and that the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. And that when, when he hurts, I hurt. And when I'm happy, he's happy. And right here, we're the aroma of Christ. So the question is going to be, where am I going to live my life with awareness? What am I going to become more aware of? My relationship with the Father, Son, and Spirit, and in Christ, and right here, and with those who are in Christ, is that where my, my oneness is going to be? You say, well, what can Edward and I actually disagree on out there? Anything these boys disagree on up here, then we can disagree on. But we have a unity that doesn't come from our agreement. We have a unity, Paul says in Ephesians 4, is a gift from God. It's His unity. It is not our unity. Can we disagree on things? Sure we can. It has nothing to do with unity. Unity is not agreement. So the question for us is going to be, what happens when we begin to walk around out here? And we notice some differences in each other. And Edward looks around and he notices that John King is also black. And he begins to go towards John King and, and meet someone else that looks like him. And I, I notice that Miss Burns here happens to be 6'8 like me. Stand up. See? And we have some things in common. And so we spend a little time together. And by the time I spend some time with other people like me and Edward spends some time with other people like him, then when we happen to see each other again, we notice more our differences because we've spent more time with people who we are like. So if we begin to try to form unity right here, it'll never happen. We'll do nothing but form division. We have to be constantly aware of where we live from. Constantly aware of where we live from. Now here's the beautiful thing. The reason I've said all this today. Thank you again, Edward. We way underestimate the power of the influence that each one of us have. I way underestimate the power of the influence of Christ in me. Val way underestimates the power of the influence of Christ in her. Linda way underestimates the power of the influence of Christ in her. Gary way underestimates. We're, we're, we live in a world where we underestimate this existence and overestimate this existence. You know what the hope of glory is? The hope of glory for all the people of the world? It is Christ in me. It's not me in First Baptist. Or me in World Outreach. Or me in the Young Democrats. Or me in wherever. In David Lipscomb. Or in Belmont University. Or me in a doctorate degree. No. Most of the people wrote that book, wherever I laid it down last, those ones following Jesus were illiterate. By the time John wrote his gospel, he either was now a great scholar or he had one with him. Because when he started out, he was illiterate. The power of God to this community is Christ in you. That is the most awesome news. God was so excited when He said, here's how we'll do it. We'll make them our home. We'll make them our home. People won't have to come to a building. This was not the idea of God. People won't have to come to an organization. I, the, or, the organic, I will come and live inside of them and they're going to live out there in their neighborhoods and their communities and soccer fields and Christ in them will be the hope of glory for all these people. Now, is there anything wrong with what we're doing when we gather? Absolutely not. Because we remind each other this very truth. So, here's what I want to say. This week, be, be, listen to yourself. Be aware of your words. 
When you have words that come out that sound like that there is still dirt in your life, you don't accept that. Correct it. Take that thought captive. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10 maybe, Take that thought captive and make it obedient to the truth. Make it obedient to Christ. Don't believe that. Just because you think it doesn't mean it's true. Believe, trust me, I do that all day long. Think stuff that's not true. Next time you start having feelings, someone makes you feel like, there's, reminds you of something from your past, a mistake you made, you just take that thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus. You start feeling like there's distance between you and God. That is not the truth. There is no distance between you and God. There's only your awareness of how close you really are. You're in Jesus. He's in you. Together, you're in the Father. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. You can't get no closer than that. You start feeling like there's some kind of distance. You've done something wrong. God's not blessing you. That is not true. Now, I'm going to tell you a couple of things that might be true. What we think sometimes are God's blessings aren't really God's blessings. They're just we got a raise and we got some good mulch now. That we don't need to start speaking in tongues because we got better mulch. Oh, hallelujah. You know, we got good mulch now. God is blessing us. It's a favor of God. Listen, if it will not bless some little woman in Ethiopia in the middle of a desert, we're not any better than anybody else on this planet. Everyone on this planet is, is the same specialness, the same preciousness to, to their Father God, their Creator. He loves everyone the same. Everybody the same. A new truck is wonderful. It's a new truck. It's a new truck. Well, God gave that to me. Well, oh, good. Oh, good. That's fine. But I'm going to tell you something. There's something more special in that new truck. And that's the seat you're seated in, right, seated in right here, in Christ. No more dirt, no more distance, no more delay. Those are lies from the accuser of the brethren. Trust the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. He'll tell you that's not right. You'll get a little check that says that's not right. But don't just let that stuff go. Take it captive and say, no. I'm going to believe the truth about who I am, the truth about where I live, the truth about the aroma that's coming from me. So let's all stand. <clears throat> I want to pray specifically this morning for those of us who struggle over and over again with feelings of shame, feelings of, um, feelings of shame, feelings of condemnation, Thoughts about stuff from your past that over and over and over again. Now, the reason I want to pray about this one specifically is because this is what Sister Lydia gave me a word on a few weeks ago. The Sunday morning that I announced uh, that I was um, going to not be the senior leader anymore that I've been for the last four years, whatever you want to call it. And um, I, it's kind of funny, John. I had someone ride by last week the building. They said, hey, I rode by your building out there and said, I don't think it's the right one. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there's a fellow named John Kenneth King. It's a preacher there. His name's on the sign out there. And I said, well, we just never changed any of that. He may be again. That might be a word from God. Who knows? <laughs> but, but the Sunday morning that I um, resigned the role that I've been in, right after the service, Sister Lydia came up to me and she said, the Lord gave me a word for you. And I said, what was it? How many ever got had Mr. Sister Lydia say that to you? <laughs> like, okay, can we say that real quietly, Sister Lydia? You know, you don't know what she's about to say, except she's smiling. And um, she said, the Lord said, Papa says for you to stop hiding behind Jesus. And you said it again this morning. Stop hiding behind Jesus as if there's something about you now that you still need to be ashamed of. You remember this morning when you said in the class that it's not just that when Papa looks at you, he sees Jesus. He sees you with Jesus inside of him, but he likes what he sees when he looks at you. There's another place that a lot of us in here need to take, me included. And that is, we stop hiding behind Jesus as if we still are afraid to have Papa look at us. 
Now that might just be me. But I don't think it is. <laughs> so, if that's, if, if that's you, we dig into this prayer right here. And the rest of us, if it's not you and you don't struggle with that, you just be praying for people around you, okay? So, Father, here we stand. Here we are. We are trusting that the finished work, your finished work through Jesus that you accomplished on our behalf is true. That when you look at us, you remember our sins no more. That we now are like our older brother Jesus, as John told us. That we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That we are holy and blameless in your sight. Even if we can't see it. So I right now, and, and if this is you, you be praying this with me. I take captive every thought. Say that with me. I take captive every thought that does not line up with the truth. That does not line up with the truth. And I make it obedient to Jesus. I make it obedient to Jesus. And it is not the truth about me. And I put my trust in what you know to be true about me. Teach me, Father, to live from this place in Christ, Christ in me, we in you, Father, sealed by the Holy Spirit, and awaken us to an awareness that is greater of that truth than anything we live in here. So now, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would seal these prayers right now. Seal our prayers right now. We need your power to break through into our thinking and into our emotions and correct those things that are not the truth. Help us, Holy Spirit, by your power to metanoia. To surrender our lower thoughts to your higher thoughts about us. So that we live in this triumphant procession along with you. You're not just dragging us along. But we live in it and experience it daily with you. <laughs>